Hello, so I'm John Paul, and so I'll make a quite rough presentation of some work we did this year. So please apologize, this presentation is far from perfect. I was actually in hospital last week, and I didn't have much time to prepare it. And I even forgot there was a meeting due to anesthesia, which had some <coughs> strange effect on my brain. But I think still the presentation will be interesting. So the work actually was not made by me. It's made by a young developer called Brighton Lacquemont. Not Brighton with H, like the web browser Python, but Brighton without H. And um, so we gave him a challenge, which was uh, to try to make an HTTP server in Python that could scale as well as Golang HTTP servers and could handle as many requests per second. So he had just three months to try to do something. So everything I'm going to talk about, and especially the links, can be found in the presentation. If you take a picture of this QR code, you'll get a link directly to the presentation. So I leave, uh, I give you 10 seconds. So, so. And this way, you don't need to worry to write anything. Does the QR code work? OK. So we'll have uh, four parts, a brief introduction on Nexedi. Then we'll go directly to the conclusions. Then you can leave. Then if you want to know why in the hell we did such a thing, then we'll explain the rationale and show some code. And anyway, even if you leave, you can still, with the QR code, get the presentation. So NextCD is a, now a more than 15 years old company, present in Europe and Asia mainly. It seems we are the largest publisher of free software in Europe if we count the number of lines or number of products we made. And we mainly do very big uh, enterprise application systems that we build, deploy, and run for more than 10 years for large companies. And we've always been profitable. We have no venture capital. We depend on nobody. We do what we want as we want. And we don't need to sell the company to anybody. So the customers we have are like uh, automotive industry, aerospace industry, now we are getting more and more automotive with uh, PSA, Mitsubishi, Toyota. We have chemical industry, highways, pretty big ones that are getting fed up by proprietary software. So we are a strict free software company. And that's why, for example, my laptop is not a Mac. Mac is proprietary. Proprietary, in my opinion, is morally evil. So I have a laptop in which even the bootloader is free software. I just took a Chromebook, recompiled it, removed Google Things, and now I have something free. But still, it's not free enough for me, so I'm currently building the next generation, which not only be entirely free, but you can also build it yourself and repair it yourself. So we really care about free software. And our business model was inspired by Richard Stallman. He told me one day, it's very simple, care about your customers in the morning and improve your software in the afternoon or maybe in the night. Then that's all. You don't need more complex business model to do free software. So that's what we've been doing for 15 years, patiently, and it builds something. We are mainly a Python shop. So ERP5 is entirely made in Python. SlapOS, which is probably the only true cloud system that really works is entirely made in Python from bottom to top. Uh, we have a low latency, resilient network called Resist that can go through the Chinese Great Firewall officially with legal license in China. It's also Python. Uh, we can store petabytes of ND arrays. Single block, for example, 30 terabyte ND arrays stored in a distributed transactional database and we put, for example, 30 of them in the single database, that's a total of one petabyte, again in Python. Everything is in Python. And I think 
we are now completely unknown compared to 10 or 15 years ago because we focus more and more on our customers and less and less in conference like this one. One of our latest achievements is to move our entire cloud on open compute hardware. So we thought, hey, can we be three times cheaper than OVH? Then we did it. And it's been released this week. So it's pretty useful because when you handle more and more data and you need more and more cores to run many processes, for example, some of our systems need 100 Python processes deployed on a cluster. You are pretty happy if 20 core with 256 gigs of RAM cost you 200 euro per month rather than 2,000. 200 is what we charge. 2,000 is what you would need to pay, for example, at Amazon. So this, this is how the company looks like. And so now let's go to the conclusions. In 2016, we read a very interesting article called UV Loop Blazing Fast Python Networking. And it's SQL at EuroPython 2016. And it's marvelous because it shows that with UV Loop, you get more transactions per second than with Golang. And Golang is well known for its very good uh, performance in concurrent jobs. So we played a bit with the code and we added one line. Instead of answering with one ca zero character, we just put one byte in the reply, in the code that was presented in 2016, then two bytes. Then we compared the number of transactions per second using the UV loop case or the Golan case depending on how many characters are being sent back in the, uh, in the handler. And we see that uh, as soon as you do something in Python, you lose an order or two orders of magnitude. You can see at 100 characters how low it can be. <coughs> so there are many talks that about um, Python performance and number of requests per second um, that show fantastic results, but the results are great because there's no Python. So we decided to try to solve this problem because uh, we got more and more worried about the fact that Python would not be able to handle the future kind of loads we expect from our customers. Here is the result. First of all, we tried to do a hello world, very stupid server. You just connect by HTTP and it answers hello world. And we tried for that simplest possible server running on four cores in parallel. So it's not single core hello world <coughs> as the 2016 presentation. It's really multi-core hello world in Python. And we are, I think, uh, depending on the version of Golang HTTP server one used, maybe 30% to two times faster. So of course, it doesn't mean much, but at least it's a first step showing that it is possible using a single Python process to completely use all cores of an Intel i7 and reach HTTP performance that is better than Go runtime. Then we try to do a bit more because uh, returning hello world sounds a bit stupid. So we programmed a Fibonacci function and we checked how many requests per second each request doing a Fibonacci call could the small i7 machine handle with let's say once one core used, two cores used, three and four. And it scales linearly, just like Golang, but a bit faster. Wow, so we decided to compare the kind of how many core routines we could spawn and execute in how much time. 
and we compared, for example, what can be done with async I.O., async I.O. with UV loop, G event, Go routines, and our little L1 based coroutines in Python. And you see the results. So it's a small four core machine. Async IO will take a total of about 10 or 8 seconds to spawn and run 500,000 empty core routines. With L1 based library, we did. It's 1.49 seconds. And the largest time is taken in spawning, which does a lot of memory allocation using malloc, which is completely uh, under optimized. If we look at the 0 0.27 here compared to 0 0.39 here in Golang, it shows that there is a hope that we can get a coroutine library that is as efficient as those in Go language when programming in Python. And I'll tell you, because we're in the conclusions, what we plan in the future. Actually, we don't use Python. We use Cyton. So Cyton looks a lot like Python, but you can see CDEF instead of DEF in many parts of the code. And there's something called NoGill that releases the gill very efficiently. And currently, this first line, CDEF class foo no gil, is invalid in Cython. So our next step is to make this little keyword valid in the Cython classes so that a function can create an instance of a CDEF class just like you would do in Python transparently with a multi-core garbage collector and everything without gil. And this way, we get something that integrates perfectly with the rest of the Python legacy, but that offers performance similar to Go language with a syntax that doesn't sound too weird to people who have practiced Python for 15 years. So you can find <coughs> references for everything I've explained. First, we studied what can be done in terms of using Python to handle all cores. Oh, sorry. So that's the first article. So everything is completely documented. How we made the HTTP server. If you click, you get uh, all explanation and uh, all code. And if you go in the right part of the article, you can find the whole source code in the repository. So it's everything public. Feel free to have a look. Um, in the references, we've added our benchmark of UV loop and how we did it, and how we show that UV loop plus Python is very slow as soon as Python does something. And the last one here, so this one is missing, I'll add it. And Act Talk is a very interesting reference we'll see later because it provides a kind of explanation how to do a good concurrent programming model for object languages that is unrelated to any kind of fashion and that can cover about any case of concurrent programming whether uh, it's um, let's say async IO type, go routines, whichever actually rather than having to choose one you can have all of them if you read that article. It generalizes, let's say, concurrent object programming. It's a 30 years old article. So now our rational. So this is our point of view of Python today. So actually, I chose Python for next study because there was a nice book, I think about 20 years ago, that explained Python to beginners and why it was used at ILM as a scripting language to do 3D animation. I don't know if you read that, read that book. And what was bright in that book was that simple was easy to learn and a simple language. <coughs> Today, it's the favorite language of developers according to some kind of statistics. Well, that's good news. 
but it is still extremely <coughs> slow in terms of runtime. 20 years ago it was acceptable because everybody was slow in scripting languages, but today it's one to two order of magnitude slower than competition. Its concurrency model with async IO is extremely poor compared to state of the art. It's like fashion suddenly got in the language through keywords, through peps, rather than thinking about the true state of the art of object-oriented concurrent programming. It's still unusable in a web browser. <coughs> if you look at uh, Go language, it works perfectly in a web browser. And now it has two competitors, JavaScript and Go, that are, let's say, have a more and more traction among younger generations. So sorry, that's why I told you, you can leave any time, you will get more and more depressed. So recently, we thought about moving our code to Python 3. Then we thought, what will it bring to our customers? I still don't know. I see absolutely no benefit for our customers. Maybe only one, it's very small. We get supported longer, we can survive 10 years. But except that, I can't tell you. No idea. Because we know the losses we get. We get incompatible strings that are going to cost us 200,000 euros to get the layers uh, that make it the old data compatible with the new data that fix the problem of pickle incompatibility. It will cost us 30K per year just to maintain a patch that will make it possible to make Python 3 compatible with the way Python 2 was working in terms of string processing. We already did it, but we are going to maintain it. It's slower, despite what people say. It requires more memory. It's getting needlessly complex for reasons I absolutely don't understand, so we are going to have cost to explain new things to our staff every year. And it added a model based on async IO that will eventually break all the transactionality of our systems. So it's terrible from our perspective, which is different from Python community's perspective. And if we look at industry adoption, Instagram adopted Python 3. I think what, that's one of the rare success cases, but Dropbox dropped it. We actually have been sponsoring for one year a Piston just-in-time compiler. We spent one man year trying to make it work. And Dropbox dropped Python and went to Go. They, they tried and to do Python because they tried PyPy and it failed for some reasons. Google prohibits using Python in production systems, as far as I know from my colleagues working inside Google. U2U brought a Python to Go transpiler. Chinese company doing cloud such as Chunyo. Chunyo is a kind of Dropbox or Akama in China. They do Go and the others do a lot of Java. So it's a bit frightening. And sometimes some Python community people who are given a keynote in a presentation spend 30 minutes explaining why people should use Java for big data. They are part of actually Python data science lab. It's really, really worrying for us. So we thought, is it time to abandon Python 3? Go language, well too costly for us to migrate. Not very convenient when you need to interface with C libraries. That's one of the marvels of C Python, it's that it's super easy to integrate any C or Fortran library to the C Python runtime. With Go, it's much, much more work. And there's nothing as good as the PyData ecosystem in Go language. So we can't migrate to Go. JavaScript, again, too costly for us to migrate. We are not YouTube, we are not Dropbox. It's not multi-core. Its concurrency model <coughs> is just as bad as I think IO. So it brings nothing to us. So we tried to become more positive, and we discovered Yodai. Who has heard about Yodai? Wow. Yodai is a project from Mozilla that brings something like a Jupyter notebook 
but running in WebAssembly in your browser. It can run JavaScript, it can run Python, NumPy, it can run Pandas, and that means with a simple URL without installing any server, you can provide a data science notebook to all your friends in one click. So we've been sponsoring now for four months your diet because it solves part of the problem of running Python in the browser because the Python interpreter is very slow in the browser but the NumPy libraries are nearly as fast as native and the combination of the two is half compared to native. The good side of your diet is that you can distribute, let's say, to one million people a notebook without purchasing a huge server. So it's really a fantastic tool. So that's, let's say, our first step to stop our depression. If you want to contribute to Mozilla Yodide, we actually pay people to do it. One person we paid has been porting scikit-learn to Yodite, and scikit-learn should be available within a month inside Yodite. Next step, we made a kind of comparison between uh, the different ways to get high performance in Python and what Golang language provides. So, I'm not saying that it's impossible to do high performance systems in Python. We are actually doing many of them. We are probably running the largest open source ERPs, with uh, 500,000 invoices and accounting and workflow processed in eight hours. So it's a huge one. <coughs> but it has to be either based on multiprocessing or it has <coughs> to be based on the support of the Nogil function in the Cython language. <coughs> whenever we need low latency, high concurrency and perfect multi-core execution with shared variables among the different threads. And whenever we can't use site on no gil, then Go language is much better. So we had this kind of comparison and we decided how can we improve site on so that it's compatible with what already exists in Python and site on. It be, it's as fast as C, but nothing to do. It's as multi-core as Go language and gets a very good concurrency model like ActTalk. And we've been now working on improving Python for about six months. The first steps were to make sure we could write a dynamic HTTP server in Python that can span across all cores of a CPU within a single process. Second steps, we wanted the same type of scheduler, it's called a work stealing scheduler, in Cython with our core routines so that we can be sure that it will eventually scale up to, for example, 24, 48 cores. I don't know if you know, but uh, a professor of Paris 7 University called Julius Trobocek explained to me that one of the beauties in Go language concurrency is the scheduler, which is based on work stealing. This is not like round robin or traditional algorithm for schedulers, and it changes completely the scalability of a coroutine system. With work stealing, you can scale up to dozens of cores without problem. So, some code. Oh. In our first step of the project, we studied which coroutines library already exists. CPC, libtask, lthread, libdeal, libmil, libco. Libtask it was, for example, created by one of the developers of the Go language. The first study we did ended up with a conclusion that none of them cover, let's say, everything one would expect from a coroutine library. That's super strange. We still don't have a good core routine library in C. Uh, then we discovered L1. So you can have a look on GitHub. What is uh, L1? So 
L1 is a super small C code that provides coroutines, an HTTP server with very, very low memory footprint and super high performance. <coughs> so what we did is just reuse L1, wrap it in Cyton. That's the beauty of Python and Cyton. Integrating C libraries is easy. In Go language, integrating C libraries is not as easy as one would expect. If we use that strength of C Python runtime, we can little by little, by combining good C libraries, Cyphon, get something that the Go language people don't have because they have this problem that they hardly integrate with existing C or Fortran libraries. So the server is defined by defining a run function and defining handlers, for example, for the root or for the Fibonacci. So it really looks like one would do with a minimalistic application server framework in Python. <coughs> then the handler looks a little bit C-ish, but not too difficult to read. And to run L1, import L1, L1 run. So if we compare this kind of code to what we would usually do in Python, and we have in mind that by doing this, we can occupy all cores of a server and get 10 to 100 times more performance, I think the effort to write a few functions like this, or a few classes like this, is really worth the result. So that's how we get this benchmark. Now look at the Fibonacci. C def Fibonacci, that's just Cyton code. If you know Cyton, nothing new. Then the handler, nothing much. And we get scalability over multiple core. Not so different from the Python we know, but huge impact on performance and concurrency. Thank you. And again, this is the QR code. pre-existing real web app developed in an existing framework such as Flask, the solution that we just presented uh, means that there's a lot of effort which can be complicated to uh, redevelop everything. That's somehow what you said. Not um, to redevelop something that exists, but just to develop something complicated. So, okay, develop something complicated. I don't believe so. Um, first of all, let's say things uh, truly, we cheated. We, what we showed is a kind of cheat. We cheated, we just used Cython, which is C, that is easy to write for Python programmers to get the performance of C. And of course it works. But although we cheated, what is interesting is that the day I show you the class, the day this kind of code becomes possible means the day you can write native Cyton classes. Then you can write Cyton code with object-oriented style programming with a garbage collector 
that's not very, very different from what we do in Python. And the resulting code will actually have the same type of expressivity as a normal Python. So the day we have this, writing a complete, say, uh, application server framework will not be very difficult. Because those parts that includes C types or, um, <coughs> or that look a little bit too much like C, you won't see them anymore because they will be wrapped in base classes written in that way. So I believe, so that's why I, that day we, we can do that. Then today, what we did, what shows that if you have, um, let's say, if you have a real HTTP server with a real um, application server framework like Flask, probably by some <coughs> inheriting tricks and integrating in the inheritance pass a CDEF class, what, and a CDEF class with a few no-gill no CDEF methods, you might make part of that application server super fast to process concurrent requests, for example, for instant messaging. So you could, for example, just focus on a small set of features where concurrency and low latency is needed, like instant messaging or <coughs> notification. Have this written a bit painfully with a CDEF and no gil. And this way, you don't need to have another server doing things next to your Python runtime, and you cut the integration cost. So I think today what we have showed already proves that we can have in the same Python runtime super concurrent, super fast services that take a bit more time to write in the same environment as kind of slow services. And the time we take to write those fast services is compensated by the cost reduction in integration. things, um, I'm sorry, what prevents doing in PyPy with no effort of rewriting code and benefits of just-in-time compiler, uh, what prevents PyPy achieve the same type of performance as what we are sh I'm showing with Cyclone? Yeah. Okay. So, um, it's so, I don't have a definite answer for this because if I look at PyPy and if I run PyPy on a rather small piece of code, for example, doing string processing, we have a code uh, that is used to process Apache logs and provides as a result a kind of ranking of the quality of the service. Uh, I forgot the name. It's something we published on PyPy. So with Py PyPy, we get 18 <coughs> times 1.8 faster result on that library. But when Dropbox tried PyPy, they get slower result. So some people say, well, it's just a problem of working more on PyPy until we get the times 18 also on Django, for example. And other people say that um, it will never happen. So which is right uh, scientifically? I cannot have a definite answer. But if you look at our track record, we invested on Piston, not on PyPy. It failed because Dropbox dropped it. And 
one of the reasons why we invested in Piston is because um, from what I see, PyPy doesn't solve the problem of guilt and makes the integration of C libraries either more complex or less efficient. And because part of the beauty of C Python is the ease of integration of C libraries, so I tend to be on the side of not believing that PyPy will remove the guild while keeping uh, a garbage collector and easily integrated C libraries. But it's a belief, it's mine. It's a great news if PyPy achieved that. You know the transactional memory part of PyPy. I'm not sure it's uh, really progressing as far as I... It's a beautiful idea, but um, I'm not completely sure it's really progressing. So we chose the Siphon way because we looked at scikit-learn. <coughs> scikit-learn is written a lot in Siphon. And we see among data scientists probably the fastest growing part of the Python community that Siphon language is perfectly accepted. So a huge part of the community has found a tool called Siphon that really helps them to write fast code. I think it makes sense to try to, uh, for us to try to leverage that tool, not for data science, but for transactional systems. Is there any other question? Well, thank you very much.